welcome to the International Daily Roundup with People's Dispatch, where we bring you some of the top stories from across the globe. Let's take a look at today's headlines. Murder of 27-year-old Richard Brooks in Atlanta leads to fresh protests across the U.S. Israeli government approves construction of new Israeli settlement in Jolan Heights, named after Trump. Egyptian LGBTQ plus activist in exile dies of suicide. Thousands of protesters occupy Sao Paulo's Paulista Avenue in anti-Bolsonaro protests. We begin with the United States where protests against police violence have intensified after the killing of a black man, Rayshard Brooks, in Atlanta. The 27-year-old was shot dead by a police officer on June 12th. A post-mortem examination conducted on Sunday by the Fulton County Medical Examiner's Office has confirmed that Brooks' killing is a homicide. A statement released by the FSME stated that Brooks' death was due to gunshot wounds in the back. According to reports, the police officers were called by a Wendy's employee who complained about Brooks falling asleep in his car at the drive through The police officers tried to arrest him, which Brooks resisted. When he tried to flee the scene, one of the officers shot him dead. Brooks was killed a day before his daughter's eighth birthday. The killing of Brooks has intensified the anti-police protests in Atlanta. On Saturday, outraged protesters gathered near the Wendy's outlet where the incident took place. Protests also prompted the dismissal of the accused officer, Garrett Rolf, and led to the resignation of the Atlanta police chief, Erica Shields. According to reports, Brooks' murder was the 48th police shooting in the state this year, 15 of which ended in fatalities. In the meanwhile, across the United States, protests against police violence triggered by the murder of George Floyd have been going on for over three weeks. Police reforms, defunding, and even dismantling of the police have become key national debates. On Friday, the Minneapolis City Council passed a resolution to pursue a community-led public safety system to replace the police department, said a Reuters report. Moving on to our next story, Israel's settlement minister announced on Sunday that the government has approved the construction of a Trump Heights colony in the occupied Jolan Heights. According to the announcement made over social media, the proposed colony will house 300 settler families replacing the existing Brusham settlement with 12 settlers. Israel captured Jolan Heights from Syria in the 1967 war. Apart from the US, no country recognizes the Israeli annexation of this territory. Recognition of the Israeli claim over Jolan Heights was one of the several pro-Israeli moves undertaken by Donald Trump's presidency. Trump also proposed a plan in January 2020 which will allow Israel to annex 30% of the occupied West Bank in return of a rump Palestinian state. Israel reciprocated the support by naming the upcoming settlement in Jolan Heights after Trump. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu at first announced the building of the settlement last year in June 2019. Similar to the Palestinian occupied territories, Israel has built several illegal settlements inside the occupied Jolan Heights. There are currently around 26,000 Israeli settlers occupying different parts of the disputed territory. On to our third story, 30-year-old LGBTQ plus and human rights activist Sarah Hagezi died of suicide on Sunday at her home in Canada. Hagezi has been living in exile since March 2018 to escape persecution by the Egyptian government. Her suicide note indicated that the exile and political persecution had taken a great toll on her emotionally. She was one of the around 60 activists who were arrested for their participation in a rock concert by a leading band from Lebanon and Cairo in September 2017. The lead singer of the band, Mashru Leela, is known as a gay celebrity and a large number of the participants waved pride flags during the concert. Sarah Hagezi and one of her comrades, Ahmed Ala, who was just 21 years old at the time, were arrested after a week of the event from their homes and were charged with habitual debauchery, inciting indecency and for joining a band group. She, along with others arrested at the time, were subjected to various kinds of mental and physical torture by the police and prison authorities. Finally, thousands of Brazilians participated in the occupation of Sao Paulo's iconic Paulista Avenue on Sunday. The occupation was a part of the protests against rising fascism and racism, and it demanded for the end of the regime of President Herr Bolsonaro. The demonstration, which started at 2 p.m. in front of the Museum of Art in Sao Paulo, mobilized around 2,000 people and had rival football fan groups coming together in the defense of democracy. The event was attended by prominent political activists such as Congress member Gleesi Hoffman of the Workers' Party 
and Gulharam Bolos, leader of the Homeless Workers Movement or the MST. Bolsonaro's government has been severely criticized for grossly mismanaging the coronavirus crisis. The president has consistently denied scientific data and opposed containment measures by state governors and mayors. He has even issued open calls to revolt against these measures and encouraged a violent right-wing movement. Recently, several progressive opposition parties have jointly filed an impeachment motion against him, which is still pending. In our In Focus section today, we bring you a conversation with NewsClick's Prabir Purkayasta on the Trump administration's decision to sanction the International Criminal Court for its investigation into U.S. war crimes in Afghanistan. Last week, the Donald Trump administration sanctioned the International Criminal Court over its probe into alleged U.S. war crimes in Afghanistan. Now, this is the latest example of U.S. exceptionalism and its disregard for international law. We bring you a discussion with Prabir Prakash on this. Prabir, thank you so much for joining us. So, we, uh, we do know that this issue has been going on for a while. In fact, uh, we are looking at war crimes that took place from 2003, and it's a fairly long period. And the ICC did look into the issue last year. They initially said that they would not, they, were, they did not give a go ahead for a prosecution. Uh, this year in March, they did. And uh, so the US has been building up this campaign against the ICC for quite some time. But uh, this is also part of a larger issue considering that the US never joined this court and was always, has always questioned its legitimacy. Well, as far as joining the court is concerned, neither is Russia, China or India. So this is, he's, the U.S. is not alone in that, and of course Israel. But you know, the bigger issue is that this threat against international organizations actually has been there for quite some time. If you remember, John Bolton actually attracted in the ICC, uh, International Criminal Court, precisely on this ground about three years back. Right. And the threat was that they will sanction the individuals involved in the investigations, and therefore, not only they, but even their families could suffer. Right. So this is one track that they have been using, that we are not going to only fight the institution concern, but we are also going to make, in some sense, uh, examples of the key officials, so that you suffer for the rest of your life. Now, and not only you, but your family. And Bolton, if you remember, had actually on the OPCW, the organization looks after uh, chemical weapons, the chemical weapons treaty. treaty. And that, uh, I think it was Jose Bustani, who was the head of that, who was a Brazilian. He not only was threatened, but Bolton went so far, far further than that. He went, in fact, far enough to say, your children study the United States. So it was an implicit threat against his sons. Now, this is the kind of politics that the United States has been playing sometimes openly, but certainly behind the veil, so to say. And this has now become far more clear on the issue of the sanctions against the ICC. Uh, ben Suda, the chief prosecutor of uh, International Criminal Court, and also her associates who are investigating this case. But it is also not only the United States and the Afghanistan case. It's also the Israel's case. Israel has been also under investigations. I think it was announced in December last year. And this has been building up. And the US threats against the International Criminal Court predate, in fact, its opening investigations against Americans on the issue of Afghanistan, of the Afghanistan uh, essentially atrocities. And they said they will investigate both the Taliban, the Afghan government, and the United States, all three of them. So you can see clearly what the US is sending is a message that all international organizations have to accept U.S. exceptionalism, which of course was there by, uh, by default. And therefore, if you don't accept that as a default state, then of course we're going to come and use all the instruments that we can against you. And it's not only the organizations, but it is also the individuals. You can see also the Huawei case, which of course is a very different case, but you can see the target was not just Huawei, but also the daughter of the largest shareholder in Huawei. And when she was traveling on business and she was the chief financial officer, the CFO, and she was arrested in Canada for violating the domestic laws of the United States. So the effective message that is being now uh, passed, and we had the earlier also the Noriega case, the US law 
runs all over the world, but international law that does not run in United States. This is the broad position that the US has. It is now sanctified, shall we say, by the sanctions they're imposing on the people involved. And of course, the International Criminal Court was really trying to uh, rectify one glaring issue that has always plagued it, that it went after African states' leaders, but it never went beyond that. It really, except uh, the Serbian case, it really did not go beyond that. And therefore, this had been held that it was essentially a pawn in the hands of powerful Western powers. And that is what it was trying to get out of, that no, it can look at the, the, the issues of atrocities, international uh, human rights violations in places like Palestine and Afghanistan. And of course, that it does bring up the basic issue that is there in the world. Does the US writ run all over the world? Or is it that it is bound by international law and international treaties? And the US position is that it doesn't. And that's what comes out more brutally, shall we say, with a Bolton and a Trump than it does with more soft-spoken uh, persons earlier, whether it be Barack Obama or it be Clinton. So when the Republicans of a certain, Republicans of a certain stripe come into uh, the administration, it becomes more open. George Bush, of course, was, as you know, the architect of various wars, but leaving that out, he also had Bolton. And it was under his presidentship that Bolton had threatened the OPCW uh, head, Joseph Bustani. So, you know, those are the kind of things which you normally associate with international thuggery. You don't associate with civil, shall we say, administrations which claim to be the global leaders. But what we are seeing is really that. And that is coming out in the absolutely, shall we say, uh, without any veil in very naked form. And this is all we have for today's International Daily Roundup. For more such stories and videos, visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Thank you for watching. Bien cantar que vamos a triunfar